Aloha and welcome to our lecture today. We are going to explore um, introduction to neurophysiology. And what that means is that we're going to talk about the brain, we're going to talk about the spinal cord, we're going to talk about uh, disorders of movement. And many of the patients that we take care of have had a stroke or a trauma that has injured their spinal cord, or perhaps they have um, some kind of uh, disease like Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease. Um, so what we're going to look at are some of the reasons behind uh, the disease process. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, the first thing that we're going to take a look at here is just the basic understanding of the nervous system. And so we want to think about dividing the nervous system into three separate functions, input, processing, and output. We can kind of liken it to a computer. We know that for input, we have a keyboard or a mouse, so I can type words into the computer. Uh, processing would be the black box, right? I have to turn on my computer in order to get the information to be processed in the black box. And then output would be the screen or the printer, right? So I could print something out after I have put information um, into my computer. It's been processed, um, uh, maybe by a spell checker or I've done some calculations and they've been processed. And then my final product uh, will be the output, uh, whatever I print out. So let's talk about the neuron. The neuron is the basic cell of the nervous system, okay? And uh, if we've maybe learned this in the past or maybe we're learning this for the first time, we have a cell body. We have an axon, which is a long tube that carries an electrical signal, and this signal is called an action potential, okay? And an action potential is the electrical signal that's carried down the axon, and it usually goes in one direction, okay? So an action potential is carried down the axon in one direction. And we also have some other components of the axon, um, we want to learn about myelin. Myelin is an insulator for the axon that helps for fast action potential. So the myelin helps the cells in our nervous system um, have a faster action potential. Okay? It's like uh, made up of glia cells. They wrap around the axon like a big flat pancake around a tube, and glia means glue. And so this myelin wraps around our axon um, and helps uh, action potentials move quickly. So if, if we were looking down into the axon, if we, if we took um, one of the axons and sliced it and we were looking down into it, here we could see the axon and we could see the myelin surrounding it. So what I'm going to do here is throw in some of the disorders um, that occur as a result of some problem going on in the system. So in multiple sclerosis, um, we call that a demyelinating disease, and it results in weakness, right? So we just kind of looked at how healthy myelin is essential for action potential, and if we don't have uh, healthy myelin, um, and in a, like a disease like multiple sclerosis where the myelin is being destroyed, um, then we have um, a weakness that occurs uh, in the body. Um, and so uh, it's also uh, important to consider how the action potential causes neurotransmitters to be released from the neuron. All right, so here we see our action potential going down um, our, our axon, and then we can see that that stimulates these chemicals to be released um, from the neuron. And these chemicals are called neurotransmitters, and they're used uh, in order for neurons to communicate with either our muscles 
are organs or other neurons. So for example, uh, we might have a chemical um, that tells uh, a, a neurotransmitter's release and tells uh, one of our muscles to move, all right? Or maybe there's a chemical that's being released, a neurotransmitter that's released um, that helps regulate our heartbeat, all right? And that would be um, a chemical being released from a neuron that would communicate with an organ, okay? Um, but we also have uh, chemicals that are released from one neuron to another neuron. And we are gonna learn more about that um, as we move through this lecture. We will learn that we have upper motor neurons and we have lower motor neurons and they communicate with each other as well. So some examples of the neurotransmitters are acetylcholine and catecholamines like dopamine, norepinephrine and epinephrine, serotonin and GABA. And so uh, throughout the different lectures that we have, we're gonna learn how the different neurotrans neurotransmitters work um, in the body. Um, and so we're gonna give some more examples um, of a disease process that can take place due to an issue happening with a neurotransmitter. Um, but for right now, uh, we're going to, to know that one neurotransmitter, okay, um, and, and one neuron work together. So each type of neuron secretes one type of neurotransmitter. And a, a good example of this is acetylcholine, which is used in the neuromuscular junction, okay? Um, so a synapse is the extracellular space where the neurotransmitter is released from one neuron onto a muscle, organ, or another neuron. So if we take a closer view of the end of our neuron and we blow it up, uh, this is what we'll be looking at. This is the, the, the end of the neuron where our neurotransmitter is released. And here we see the red dots, uh, which are stored in packets uh, that are wrapped around white by these little blue circles. And these packets store our neurotransmitter and they're called vesicles. And what happens is when the neuron fires, the vesicles release neurotransmitters um, during an action potential. And then we can see that there is this space called the synapse. Um, and then there is a, uh, another um, receptor on the other side where communication takes place, okay? So we have our presynapse and our postsynapse. So on the postsynaptic membrane, there are receptors that sense the neurotransmitter. So myasthenia gravis is weakness that is caused by circulating antibodies that block the acetylcholine receptors at the postsynaptic neuromuscular junction. And this inhibits the effect of the acetylcholine. All right, and so this is another type of disorder where there is weakness of the muscles in the body. It's a different reason, right? We talked a little bit ago about multiple sclerosis. We said that multiple sclerosis was due to problems with healthy myelin, that as myelin was being destroyed, we couldn't have our, our action potentials happening quickly enough in order for us to have um, healthy muscle movement, right? So that results in, in weakness as well. In the case of myasthenia gravis, what we have is we have antibodies that are blocking, okay, the receptors in that neuromuscular junction. So the neuron is trying to communicate with the muscle and it can't do that because of these antibodies, okay? So in this case, uh, we have a problem with our um, neurotransmitter uh, being able to be, to be um, used properly in that uh, junction, all right? So myasthenia gravis is a disease of um, the acetylcholine action in the muscle, okay? So do not confuse a nerve with a neuron. 
A nerve fiber is actually a collection of neuron axon fibers. And we said that on a neuron, the potential can only go in one direction, okay? But in a nerve, right, which is a collection of neurons, we can have signals going in both directions. We can have motor signals um, that are going out. So in other words, I'm moving my hands right now. That's a motor signal that's going out. These are efferent. And then we have afferent, which are sensory, um, which are the types of sensory input that is coming in, okay? Um, and that might be me touching a hot stove um, or feeling something hot or cold, right? Um, that would be a sensory input. And so if we cut through a nerve and we were looking down into the nerve, we can see all these neuron axon fibers firing simultaneously, right? Sometimes there's, there's information coming in through our senses, and sometimes we're making decisions about what to do about that sensory information, and that information is being sent out, right, in the way that we choose to move our body or speak or do something. We make a decision, and then we act upon it, um, and that is output. Okay, so for input, we've kind of mentioned the senses, uh, vision, hearing, touch, smell, and taste um, are the input. Um, there are other inner body senses like proprioception um, that have to do with input. And this has to do with our body position. Um, a good example of this is when um, you're intoxicated, uh, you cannot stand with your eyes closed um, and touch your finger um, to your nose. I can do that right now, even though my eyes are closed because I have good proprioception. If I were um, intoxicated, um, then I may not have as good proprioception and it might be more obvious to the police officer that I cannot close my eyes and touch my nose. So that's an inner body sense. Another example of an inner body sense would uh, be our vestibular system. This has to do with head acceleration. So an example of this is uh, a benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Um, benign, meaning it's not life-threatening. Uh, paroxysmal, meaning it's sudden, or you'll have these brief spells um, where you move your head and you get these uh, dizzy spells or vertigo spinning sensation. And this has to do with uh, triggered by our position changes. Um, and so this is a disorder that some people have. Uh, and it can be um, kind of irritating when you move your head in a certain way and you get these dizzy spells that come on. But this has to do also with our inner body senses. Uh, we also can sense our organs. Inner body senses include organ senses, meaning that we can feel pain um, in our abdomen. We can feel pain in our stomach. Uh, we can feel our heart uh, palpate when our heart is beating fast. Um, and these are inner body senses. So um, in terms of processing, right, we have our conscious processing. This is our perception of the world around us, our memories that we have from the past, our emotion, um, and our thought. And so uh, all the conscious processing that takes place is it kind of like when we talked about the black box of the computer, right? Um, this conscious processing um, takes place in our brain. And then we have some unconscious uh, processing, which is kind of reflexive. And these are kind of hardwired um, in us. And so an example of some unconscious processing would be like a deep tendon reflex when we use the reflex hammer um, and we, we hit the patellar tendon and then we have that uh, quick reflex that occurs when our, when our foot kicks up. And all this kind of takes place 
kind of at the level um, of our spinal cord. This processing is kind of hardwired. Um, that message doesn't have to go all the way up into our brain in order for us to, to kick out in a deep tendon reflex. Another example of this is um, a pain reflex. So if we touch something very hot, we have this uh, natural reflex to pull away very quickly. This is hardwired. We move our hand away from that hot object um, really without having that entire process uh, of going up into the brain and coming back down to tell our hand to move. This happens at the level of the spinal cord. And we'll look at that um, in more detail a little bit later. But this is an example of unconscious processing, right? I'm not really thinking about removing my hand. It's happening, okay? Um, and then we have our voluntary output, which is our controlled skeletal muscle. And all these words mean the same thing. Movement, locomotion, motor, and pyramidal system. So the one that kind of sticks out there that's new to you is this idea of the words pyramidal system. Um, but it really just means our motor system. Okay, and this is voluntary output. When we talk about skeletal muscle, we're talking about the muscles in my arms are my skeletal muscles, right? I can move my hands, um, and I'm doing that voluntarily. Um, and it's important to keep in mind <clears throat> that output, voluntary output, has an emotional context to it, right? And this is kind of a good example of that in that if we are being chased by a woolly mammoth, um, we are going to voluntarily uh, use our skeletal muscle to run away from a threat. Um, this is our, our, our fight or flight. In this case, we can see this caveman fleeing from this uh, dangerous situation. Um, and this is having an emotional context to it, and that would be fear, right? He has fear and that motivates him to do something. And so involuntary output is also um, important to remember. We don't actively control certain things that happen in our body, um, and so there is some involuntary output. For example, our pupils respond when we shine a light in them, we have constriction of the pupil. I don't will that to happen. That is an involuntary response that occurs. Um, and we have these um, in other places as well. Our throat, our bowels, our bladder, our tears, saliva. Uh, we don't tell our heart to beat. We don't, um, you know, we can control our breathing, but when I'm sleeping, I'm not controlling my breathing, right? It's happening automatically, okay? Or I can, I can choose to breathe heavy, right? Um, but generally, um, when we think of uh, some of these um, uh, autonomic functions or automatic functions, uh, these are our involuntary um, functions. And so, uh, for example, we have smooth muscle in our heart. Um, and that is muscle that um, is, is of, of control that is not willful, okay? This is our involuntary um, smooth muscle control. Another example of this would be when I chew a bite of food and I swallow it, I don't tell the muscles in my esophagus to push the food down into my stomach. Uh, peristalsis takes place. Uh, without me thinking about it, okay? Um, there are muscles in our esophagus, in our stomach, and in our gastrointestinal tract that propel that food all the way through until we have a bowel movement and release the waste, and I don't actively control that. Um, so paralyzed and awake for surgery. So paralytic drugs only affect motor movement, right? Paralytic drugs don't reduce pain or sensation. And paralytic drugs do not diminish thought or emotion. So um, they only block the movement at the neuromuscular junction. So someone may, may appear unconscious because they, they have no output, right? 
because we have blocked something at the, at the neuromuscular junction, the person cannot move, okay? So unless they're given other drugs to sedate them, they could be awake and aware and suffering. So uh, when we um, put somebody um, in a state of um, sedation, right, that there is a difference between someone being sedated and somebody being paralyzed, okay? And so we naturally assume that when we see someone who is unresponsive and not moving, that they are unconscious. But this is not always the case. It's very important for us to talk to everyone as if they can hear you. Whether that person is able to respond to you um, may just be an, I an issue of, of their output but they are, ha they are just fine in terms of their input, right, their senses. Um, and so if we see individuals in a wheelchair uh, with distorted facial features, um, we tend to assume that they might be mentally retarded. Um, but maybe they have amyotropic lateral sclerosis, which we'll talk more about. Um, this is um, Stephen Hawking who had ALS, who was in a wheelchair, who was unable to move, who had kind of a distortion in his facial features. He was unable to speak, um, but he was actually one of the most brilliant people um, of our time. Um, people can seem retarded or unconscious because of their movement and speech, but maybe it's only an output or movement problem with normal senses, emotion, and thought. Okay. Stephen Hawking was a renowned astrophysicist and best-selling author. And uh, he had ALS, uh, which is a movement disorder, um, also uh, called motor neuron disease or Lou Gehrig's disease. It was initially um, uh, made famous through the baseball player Lou Gehrig, who had uh, neuro, uh, amyotropic lateral sclerosis. Um, but uh, Stephen Hawking uh, lived a full life. He was married. Um, here he is with his daughter, Lucy. Um, he has since uh, passed away, um, but he lived um, a very full life and was uh, a very brilliant and productive man. Um, a couple of other disorders, uh, Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease, are both types of movement disorders, um, but they are a disease in the brain's basal ganglia. Um, because this is a degenerative disease, it does eventually dis, uh, degenerate into an, a disorder of processing or thought that does result in dementia. Um, but early in the disease, uh, these folks, again, may appear as though um, they are not uh, able to uh, respond uh, to you, or it may be that they have strange motor movement. So, for example, in the case of Huntington's disease, they have these chorionic movements, and you'll sometimes see people maybe out on the street, and they're moving in this very strange way, and it's uncontrolled, and you might think to yourself that that person is on drugs or that person is, is crazy, um, when in fact, maybe what they're suffering from is Huntington's disease. Um, these movements are uncontrolled movements. Um, and like I said, they may be perfectly aware of what's happening around them and understand you when you speak to them. They have normal thoughts and normal emotion. What they don't have is control over their motor movements, okay? Um, unfortunately, it does uh, end up uh, resulting in dementia. Um, and oftentimes people will actually uh, say that, that because these, um, uh, affect different parts of the, the basal ganglia, that they're opposites, um, but they're actually quite similar, um, Huntington's and Parkinson's. Okay, so now we're going to get into a little bit uh, more of the anatomy. So we're going to talk about the central nervous system. So if it's inside the skull, or the spinal column, it's the central nervous system. This means the brain and the spinal cord. Um, this also includes the eye and the optic nerve. If it's outside of the skull or the spinal column, it's the 
um, peripheral nervous system. So this is nerves of the body and the head. Cranial nerves 3 through 12 are the PNS. So let's talk about the cerebrum. Here is our cerebrum, and we notice how the surface of the cerebrum is convoluted, and this adds to its surface area. A gyrus is a raised area, and a sulcus is a groove. We have a central sulcus that kind of separates the front part of our brain from the back part. And uh, we wanted to divide the, the front and the, the cerebrum into two distinct regions. Um, the front being more involved with o a motor output and um, the back being more involved with input um, or sensory information that's coming in. Um, we can uh, further um, divide the lobes of the brain um, by referring to them as the frontal lobe, uh, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. And we know that the frontal lobe um, deals with emotion. And we said also uh, that, mo that, that motor planning kind of requires an emotional contact. All right, so we've got our primary motor strip here in the frontal lobe, um, and we, we've also got kind of some of our emotional context um, happening in this uh, frontal lobe as well. And this kind of takes us back to the idea of how motor planning does require emotional context, which is why it would make sense that, that those areas um, are kind of working together in that in that close space. Um, and so neurologists have really learned a lot about the brain by examining the behavior of creatures with brain damage. So we know that a chicken with its head cut off continues to run around in a circle. And that's because of reflexes that are just happening really kind of in the spinal uh, uh, part of the chicken's body. Um, they, even though the brain is not there, um, the, there are reflexes in place where the chicken continues to run. Another example of how um, we've learned uh, about the, the human brain from other humans who have suffered brain damage is uh, the case of Phineas Gage. Um, he was one of the most revealing human case histories. He was an American railway construction worker, and what happened was he was in a blasting accident, which left uh, a metal rod driven through his left cheek and out the top of his head. And so he suffered brain damage, and if we kind of look at how that uh, injury took place here, we can see where the skull was damaged in the frontal lobe, um, and he survived this accident. Um, but after the accident, his, his behavior changed. Um, he became inconsiderate, moody, foul-mouthed, unable to plan ahead. Um, uh, other people uh, from history described him as once being a very hard worker. He, he then became very lazy after the accident. Um, um, and what it did is it provided evidence um, that the frontal cortex, which was severely damaged um, in his case, was involved in this forward planning and in his behavior. Um, and actually, the study of people with frontal lobe injury led to the frontal lobotomy, which was a surgical procedure uh, that was used to treat certain mental illnesses. It was developed to treat severe mental health conditions and address the problem of overcrowding in psychiatric institutions during the 1930s. And really one of the biggest uh, risks for nurses uh, in, in, in this time uh, was if you worked in one of these places, um, you know, you had a high risk of being hurt or even killed by a patient um, who was um, out of control, right? And so uh, the frontal, uh, frontal lobotomy was used to um, get these individuals to a place where they were very docile and um, no longer violent and dangerous. Um, however, um, it became a, a, um, 
kind of a, a situation where it was considered to be inhumane to do this to a person um, and uh, it eventually became outlawed um, around much of, in much of the world, the frontal lobotomy. So uh, let's take a look at the left and the right motor strip. Um, what we're looking at now is a coronal section of the brain. So basically what this would be is that if you took uh, a very large uh, knife and you sliced straight through the top of my head in this direction, and then you took the front of my face off and you were looking directly at what's underneath. Um, we have a, a right and left motor strip, and each motor strip actually controls the opposite side of the body. Uh, and if we look here, we can see the motor strip in the cerebrum is somatotopically arranged. And what this means is that specific body parts are associated with a distinct location on the motor strip. So if you look at this image here, um, just the amount of um, 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 part of the motor strip that is dedicated to our mouth and our face and our eyes is it, it, it's facial features, eyes, speech, such a large amount of it is dedicated to our face. Look how much of it is dedicated to our hand. And think about all the intricate things that we can do with our hands, like, you know, a surgeon can perform surgery, an artist can draw a beautiful um, painting, um, and all this requires, you know, a lot of um, ability, right, to manipulate the way that we use our hands. Um, and then you can see the other uh, places of the body that, that are given um, part of the place on the motor strip. So I'll just give you a second to look at that and think about that. Um, so this is the motor strip, but we also have a sensory, right? A sensory strip, and it's also arranged somatotopically, meaning that we kind of have a map of how um, the different uh, parts of the body um, get, get the attention from this sensory strip. And so again, you can see the face, the tongue, um, the mouth, the gums, um, the fingers, the hands um, are all part of this as well um, as other places where sensory input um, comes. And so we have a primary somatosensory strip as well. Um, and it's located more on the back um, part of our brain. We have our primary visual cortex um, and our occipital lobe. We have our primary auditory cortex. Uh, that's where our sound comes in. Um, and so this is where the sensory information comes together um, to be processed in our association cortex. So we've got sensory input coming in um, from what we're seeing, what we're hearing, what we're sensing. We process that information in our association cortex, and then it communicates with our frontal association cortex, okay? So we've got input, touching, hearing, seeing, smelling, uh, all of this gets processed. And then this input gets processed. A decision will get made about what to do about it, right? Uh, there, there's output processing that takes place in our frontal uh, part, frontal lobe, where we're planning our motor movement. And then um, our motor strip, right, um, in our brain is where that uh, signal then gets, gets pushed out into the body, right, um, in order to make our muscles do what we want them to do. And so the motor system begins in the primary motor cortex. And we can see here our motor strip. We said it was part of our voluntary muscle movement. And we can look at a cross section of the brain to look at the tissue that's inside. And so a little bit ago, I gave you an example of looking at a coronal section. We can also look at a sagittal section. A sagittal section would be, um, if I turn to the side, 
and I cut through this way and pulled half of my, my face and my brain off, and then you were looking inside. So we have coronal sections and sagittal sections. Um, so right now what we're looking at is a, a coronal section of our motor strip. Cortex means bark. It means outer covering, like a tree bark. Um, and what we have um, here is we've got gray matter and we've got white matter. Um, we're going to just be focusing in on the gray matter for just a second. Uh, the gray matter, there are these pyramid-shaped cells, and these are the cell bodies. Okay, So we have pyramid-shaped cells in our gray matter, um, and that's where the word pyramidal system right? Because they're pyramid-shaped cell bodies, the voluntary motor system is called the pyramidal system, okay? And these pyramidal motor neurons are also called our upper motor neurons, okay? So the cortex, the gray matter, is the cell bodies of the upper motor neurons, okay? The white matter is actually the axon fibers of the upper motor neurons. So we have the cell body in the gray matter, we have the axon fibers in the white matter. And the upper motor neuron travels from the brain and it terminates into our spinal cord, okay? So, uh, so we're looking at long tracks, right? These fibers, these long tracks of axons uh, are pathways and they, they originate up in our brain. Right? in that pyramidal system where those uh, pyramid-shaped cells um, are our upper motor neurons. Okay? So if we talk a little bit now about the spinal cord, uh, we know that the spinal cord begins at the crossing of the pyramidal uh, system at the pyramidal decusation. Decusate means to cross. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a close-up of our spinal cord. Okay, so we're blowing it up. We're blowing it up and we're, we're now looking at a cross section of it. So we're taking the spinal cord and we're cutting it in two. And we're looking at a cross section of the spinal cord. So here we can see the front, the ventral part of the spinal cord and the gray matter. Again, there's gray matter in the spinal cord as well. Okay, and then we have white matter, um, which is the outside, okay? And we, we have these lower motor neurons, all right? And these lower motor neuron cell bodies are in the gray matter um, of, our, of our spinal cord. And um, what they do then is communicate with our muscles uh, out in the body, right? They communicate with our muscles, they communicate with our uh, organs. Um, uh, and so the upper motor neuron originates in the cerebral cortex, travels down to the spinal cord, while the lower motor neuron begins in the spinal cord and branches out into the body to communicate um, with our muscles. And so this is kind of what it looks like if we're putting it all together. We've got our pyramidal system, which is our upper motor neuron in the primary motor strip of the frontal lobe. It, its axons travel through the brain and then through the brain stem, cross at the pyramidal decusation, which defines the beginning of our spinal cord, and then descend um, into our spinal cord in the lateral corticospinal tract. Now, I know corticospinal is a big word, but just think about it. Cortical, right? Cortical from the brain to the spine. Corticospinal, from the brain to the spine, okay? And we have, uh, this is basically then the pathway of the upper motor neuron, all right? And then what happens is that upper motor neuron axon fiber terminates in the anterior spinal gray matter onto the lower motor neuron, okay? And then what happens is that lower motor neuron fires and it causes our muscle to contract, okay? So let's look at that again. 
we have our signal from our upper motor neuron axon fiber it terminates in the anterior spinal gray matter onto the lower motor neuron because remember we said sometimes neurons communicate with other neurons we have our lower motor neuron who then communicates with the muscle, causing it to contract, okay? And that is how our voluntary muscle system works, our pyramidal system. Okay, so I think that's enough for today. Uh, I thank you for your attention, and next time we will spend some time talking about movement disorders.